Ten years ago, my husband and I had an argument. That is never fun. Being at fault, I said, sorry. I noticed JT was unusually quiet during dinner. There was tension in the air and a knot in my stomach. What my apology had lacked in elegance, I thought it made up in simplicity. Apparently not. Recognizing that my apology had failed miserably, I did what any well-trained expert communicator would do. I went inside and asked myself a question. What's the matter with him? <laughs> Actually, I asked him, what's the matter? He said, well, I just wish you would apologize. I wanted to say, what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> But I said something like, I said I was sorry. And then I got curious. JT, what was I supposed to say? That's when I heard it. Honestly, Jen, I wanted you to say you were wrong. Wow. Looking back, I realized that instead of making me guess, he had given me a gift. What happened next? I said, that's, that's what I meant to say. I made a mistake, and I was wrong. And soon, the tension between us lifted like a fog rolling out to sea. We went on to have a happy evening, and I had my usually easygoing husband back. This experience between us was directly related to my work as a clinical psychologist, and it sparked my research on apologies and forgiveness. I realized JT's not alone. We all have scripts, they come from our childhood, for apologies. But the trouble is, we have a glaring lack of awareness about effective apologies. In my work as a business consultant, I've seen my share of failed apologies. It's so easy to feel overlooked, undervalued, and ignored. And I know the real cause of trouble in our offices today, it's that we work with people who don't know how right we are. <laughs> Every time we get offended, it creates an emotional block between us and them. And the next time it happens, another block, until we have a big wall And it's very hard to talk through a wall or around a wall, and it doesn't go away just with the passing of time. But apologies require vulnerability, and they feel too risky to some people. Now, TED speaker and researcher Brene Brown insists vulnerability does not mean weakness. Now, if I could talk to that person in your office who hasn't given a decent apology since the Bush administration, that's 41, not 43, here's what I would say. You are crushing your credibility and trashing your trust. This is stunting your career growth and causing untold frustration for the rest of us. What we really need are baby steps for apologies. My passion is to help people know what to say whenever sorry isn't enough. To that end, we have amassed what may be the world's largest data set on apology preferences, and we're just beginning. The impact of our findings on relationships at home and at work could be truly transformative. Now, who do I mean when I say we? I realized that JT and I were speaking different languages, and I thought there might be a lot of people in the same boat. So naturally, I reached out to Gary Chapman, New York Times bestselling author of the relationship book, The Five Love Languages. He was kind enough to sit down with me, and we began by reviewing his five love languages. Those are words of affirmation, quality time, receiving gifts, acts of service, and physical touch. What he says is if you really want someone to feel loved or appreciated, you should not speak your own love language, but you should speak theirs. Otherwise, you're just going to be wasting your effort. When we sat down and talked, I shared with him just what I've shared with you here. And I added, 
When it comes to apologies, the key word is sincerity. We want to know, do they really mean this, or are they just trying to get this behind us? And I told him that I was struck by the similarity between the, this need to match up our apologies with what they expect and the need to match up love languages with what they expect. Then I waited for his reaction. To my relief, he really resonated with the idea. He said, yes, for any relationship to last beyond the initial infatuation stage, people have to be able to apologize. And about a few months later, he gave me this endorsement. He said, Jennifer, what you have brought to my attention, along with the love languages, I would call the other essential for happy, healthy relationships. So we teamed up for some research that became our book, When Sorry Isn't Enough. To date, we've asked 45,000 people, what do you most want to hear when people apologize? And a second question, when people apologize to you, what do you expect them to say or do? You might want to make a mental note of these questions because they're good ones for you to use in your own life. Now, their answers fell into five categories. And I promise we weren't looking for five, although we know he really likes that number. <laughs> and we coined the term apology languages for these five different ways of saying, my bad. Each one is a separate key. Now, if you have a key and it unlocks a door, you might be tempted to use that on every door. But that would be foolish and would only end up in frustration. It's the same way with our apology languages. Now, I'm going to share with you percentages on how popular each of our five apology languages are. This data is hot off the press for our event today. The first apology language is expressing regret. Forty people most want to hear us say, I'm sorry, but that is not a complete sentence. It's important that we give detail about their feelings, how we've made them feel sad, angry, frustrated, worried. They need to know that we really get it. And if it's just a small offense, that may be enough. But if it's something that's either serious or repeated, they're really going to want to hear their apology language. It might be something like our second language, accepting responsibility. 37% of people most want to hear us say, I was wrong. See, I've been practicing. <laughs> now, this is really hard for some people to say. We find especially people who come from a family of origin, or we call it FOO in psychology speak, the kind that put the fun back in dysfunction, they may have been told all the time, not just what they did wrong, but that they were bad, bad, bad. And they learned to cover up their mistakes. The fact is, we all make mistakes. Our third language of apology is making restitution or making amends. 10% of people really want us to ask them, what can I do to make this right? For them, talk is cheap. They want to see action. Our fourth one is revising the plan. 10% of people also want to hear us say what's going to be different going forward. They want to know that we've put some time and effort into making a better plan. This didn't work. So we should tell them, OK, this is a new insight I have about where I went off track or how much I dislike the situation. Here's a, we can't promise we won't make a mistake, but here's my best plan for preventing us from ending up in this bad spot again. And our final language of apology is the request for forgiveness. 3% of people most want to be asked that question. Will you please forgive me? Now, you may be saying, Jennifer, I, I've never asked that question. That would never even pop into my head. But the fact is, for people who, as children, were expected to ask that question, 
they're going to expect that of us. And if we don't ask them, they may feel like we're holding out on them. Or we were just getting warmed up for a great apology. Why did we stop? So those are our five languages of apology. As you can see, you simply can't guess what's going to speak to a person. And if you're talking to someone you don't know what their apology language is, or if you're giving an apology to a group, we recommend that you use all five. Now, I do blogging about apologies in the media, and I find that public figures use all five of these only 1% of the time. <laughs> Lots of bad language about this, yes. Mistakes were made. Uh, to the extent that you were offended, we apologize. <laughs> I had such a good time analyzing apologies by Tiger Woods, Lance Armstrong, and any number of baseball players. <laughs> <laughs> you also might notice, as you look at these numbers, that there's a huge imbalance. And someone might be asking themselves, OK, do we really need to focus on the meager 3% who want the request for forgiveness? If you are a smart manager, you will. I worked with a company that was, had an um, employee named Sarah, and that, actually, I'm making up that name, but I'll call her Sarah, and she paid such close attention to every single detail that she was driving her work team crazy. <laughs> One day, a guy who I'll, I'll call John blew up on her again. And he actually did come to her the next day and started to give her, I'd call it a quasi-apology. He said something like, Sarah, I shouldn't have said that. But you see, Sarah is in the 3%. And John was way out of the ballpark with what she wanted to hear. She was left thinking, and give me some more here. But John wouldn't budge. And after a, a little bit, when she wouldn't let up, he began to lob stink bombs at her. Give me a nod if you've ever been hit by one of these phrases. We can't do anything about it now. You're too sensitive. It's time to move on. Why can't you just drop it? And this one's really popular. Let's let the past stay in the past. Hopefully, we can all do better than John did. Let me share a few tips with you that we've learned along the way. First, we want our body language to match up with our words. Everyone has that BS meter, and it will go off <laughs> if we seem very closed. Now, I also want you to not apologize by text. Don't you all hate that? Yeah, friends don't let friends text apologies. <laughs> None of your body language is going to come through that way. And it's just too simple. It doesn't show your sincerity because it's too easy. Now, if it's a serious apology, I want you to consider writing it out and taking it and reading it to them. The time you took to write it will show them your sincerity. Also, don't let yourself get distracted, so leave that cell phone behind. And then I've narrowed it down to three defensive apology mistakes that people often make. Let's not blame, excuse, or deny. Those happen to spell bed. Blaming, that seems to come naturally to kids. And I know a few adults who haven't outgrown that yet. <laughs> when my younger son had a Lego creation that turned up a broken part to pieces, he honed in on me as the culprit. And he said repeatedly that I was at fault. And finally, I went to him and I said, Russell, I'm tired of you blaming me for having busted your Legos. I'm sorry about it, but I didn't do it. Well, he leveled his gaze on me. And with his five-year-old logic, he said, I'm not blaming you. I'm saying you are the one who caused it. <laughs> <laughs> we also need to be careful not to make excuses. Benjamin Franklin said this, never ruin an apology with an excuse. 
And a red flag that an excuse is coming is when we hear the word but, especially but you, right? Then we know, okay, they've stopped apologizing and they're now blaming me for their poor actions. <laughs> and we don't want to deny what we've done. We should never try to bluff our way around an apology. When people make a mistake, we admire those who admit their missteps. It is the quality of our relationships that drives our happiness in life. So when we return to those imperfect people in our world, let's commit to doing our part to make things right with others. Let's put ourselves into their shoes and give them what they really want and need. What's the payoff? Your team members will trust you. Your customers will be loyal to you. You'll be replacing discord with harmony. Your relationships will be more peaceful and productive. And you, you will feel glorious freedom. Now, as I've talked today, someone has come to your mind. How do I know? The hundreds of people with whom I've talked have told me so. Here's what you can do when you feel like you've already tried everything to make things right with someone. Demonstrate leadership. Make the next move. To make sure you aren't just missing it like I did with JT, use all five apologies in your key ring. When you look back, you will never regret it.